Our scripture reading this morning comes from the 16th chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans, and I'll explain why I chose this reading a little bit later. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at Sincrea, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints, and help her in whatever she may require from you. For she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, who work with me in Christ Jesus, and who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Eponidas, who was the first convert in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard among you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who were in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apellus, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my relative Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and greet his mother, a mother to me also. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Scripture reading this morning was a little bit unusual. In fact, I would be willing to bet that that scripture passage may never have been read in the sanctuary of Shandon United Methodist Church before and may never be read again. I don't know. I promised you an explanation. I'll give you a couple of explanations. In the first place, I wanted to impress you with my ability to pronounce biblical names. Now, there's a secret There's a trick. If you're ever in that situation so you don't crash and burn, it's as simple as say it with confidence because nobody else knows how those names are pronounced. And if you say it with confidence, they think you know what you're talking about, whether you do or not. More importantly, seriously, that passage of Scripture gives us a marvelous window into the character of St. Paul in particular and into the life of the early church in general. Now, I'm not here today to be St. Paul's PR man, though it does seem sometimes he could perhaps use one. There are rumors that circulate about St. Paul. For example, uh, many people would say that St. Paul was a power-hungry, autocratic, dictatorial religious leader whom nobody liked. Well, in fact, if you read those verses from Paul's letter to the Romans, there are 286 words in the verses that we read, 286 words, and 29 times in those 286 words, Paul greets a fellow Christian in Rome. That's once in every 10 words, Paul is greeting someone. This is the Paul who nobody likes and who has no friends. Maybe we need to rethink that. Another rumor about St. Paul is that he was down on women. In fact, in the greetings that he sends out in Romans 16, one third of the people he greets are women. And he says some very complimentary things. He says one is prominent among the apostles. 
He says one has worked hard for the gospel. One risked her neck to save his life. One is like a mother to him. And this is Paul who is down on women. Maybe we need to rethink Paul's reputation, but we're going to leave Paul to the side for this morning, and we want to focus on the life of the early church. So if you look at Paul's greeting to the Romans, one of the things you you have to take away is that the life of the early church was all about friendship and relationships and connections. So ask yourself this question. If you lived 2,000 years ago, why would you want to be a Christian? The truth is Christianity was an upstart, Johnny-come-lately religion in those days. Many Romans didn't even know what a Christian was. But the ones who did tended to look down their noses at Christians. And sometimes Christians were even persecuted. So why would you want to be a part of this group? It wouldn't really do anything for your standing in society. Well, from a human standpoint, the early Christians found love in the church. They found love. They found friendship. They found relationships. They found community. And after all, those are some of the most important things in life. The early church centered around life in community. But life in community was not the invention of the early church, not by a long shot. The idea of life in communion has deep biblical roots. We're finishing up disciple Bible study this afternoon. And one of the things that I always tell the disciple Bible study group at the beginning of the class is, If I ask a question and you don't know the answer, just raise your hand and say relationship. And 95% of the time, you'll be right because the Bible is all about relationships. I was intrigued just last week to find out that one of my favorite Old Testament scholars has just finished a new book. And the title of the book is God So Loved the World. I'm sorry, let me start that over. (laughs) The title of the book is God So Enters Into Relationships That dot, dot, dot. And I thought that was a very strange title until I began to realize that he's taking off on John 3.16. God so loved the world that. And obviously the the point of the book is going to be that God loves the world by entering into relationships with us. This is the story of the Bible. Think about the story of the Bible with me all the way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1. It tells us that God created human beings in God's image. And immediately after that, it clarifies that by saying, male and female, he created them. In other words, the image of God is not something that we carry around inside us as an individual. The image of God is what we have together in our life in community. If you read on to the second chapter of Genesis, the Lord surveys what he has been creating, and he says to himself, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will create a partner for him. Life in community, right? You read on to the third chapter of Genesis. The man and the woman decide they're going to they're do it their way. They're going to take things into their own hands. They disobey God. And all of a sudden, life in community begins to fall apart. They don't completely destroy it. But a black cloud begins to hover over life in community. And that black cloud is, is still with us today. You know, we don't often enough see true life in community in our world. All too often we see scapegoating and stereotypes and tribalism, but that's because we live in a fallen world. It's not the way God wants it to be. God's original plan is for life in community. Well, read on in the book of Genesis, just a few more chapters, and God decides that things are are fragmenting quickly in the world, 
And so God is going to do something to begin to bring God's creation back so that it's on track. God decides to call two people, a husband and a wife, Abraham and Sarah. And God says to them, I'm going to make you the ancestors of a nation, a great nation. Not a, not a group of individuals, but a great nation. And the climax of God's promise is, through you and your people, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So at the very beginning of the Bible, God embarks on what we might call a community building project. And the rest of the Bible is the story of how God blesses the world through the people of Israel. The Bible is all about relationships from beginning to end. But you know, for us as Christians, it goes even deeper than that because we believe that in God's very own life, God is relationship. We believe that God is mysteriously the perfect loving communion of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the Bible and the Christian tradition teach us that life in communion, life in community, is fundamental to who God is and to who we've been created to be. Now that's the theoretical, theological framework. Let's leave that behind and let's, let's think more practically about things. You and I have been missing life in community lately. We've been missing each other. This is especially true in the church. We are longing to be back at church. We're longing to be back hugging on each other. An interesting thing is, is going to happen this week. We're, we're trying to experiment with some takeout lunches on Tuesday. And we have... 60 or more people who've signed up to come get takeout from the church. And partly that's because Tim's a good cook. But part of it, I know, is simply that we want to be back at church. I see people who bring their children to play on the church grounds. I see adults who sit out on some of the benches just to, to talk with each other. We are longing to be back together again in church. And the tough pill for us to swallow is that we won't be able to be back as soon as we would like to be back. And when we do get to come back, we won't be able to do as much hugging as we would like. That's tough news. It's tough news. When I was a little boy, I learned a rhyme at church, and I bet many of you learned the same rhyme. The rhyme goes, there's the church and there's the steeple open the doors, and there are the people. And the cool thing, if you're in kindergarten, is that it has some hand motions. You put your hands together, there's the church. You put your fingers up, and there's the steeple. And you open the doors, and there are the people. Now, this is a bit of a trick if you're in kindergarten, because to make your people come up, you've, you've actually got to put your hands together with your fingers down. And instinctively, when we put our hands together, we put our hands together with our fingers up. This was a real challenge for me, and, and it was one of the great intellectual breakthroughs of my childhood when I learned to make my church so that I could get people into my church. Well, you know, the sad thing today, folks, is we got to go back to the old way of doing it, right? We open the doors, and there aren't any people at church, and it's sad. It is so, 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 so sad. We miss you, and I say that on behalf of all of us who work here at Shandon United Methodist Church. The custodians, the kitchen team, the preschool teachers, the education team, the administrative staff, the pastors, the musicians, all of us miss you. You are the reason that we do what we do. The church is the people church is you and we miss you but you know this is even a, a wider phenomenon than just a church issue right this issue cuts across all of society we're all missing each other teachers are missing students students are missing teachers whoever thought we would say that 
but I've heard it from both groups lately. We miss each other. We miss the people who used to serve us at our favorite restaurants. We're missing each other. Just this last week, I had a call from Dunbar Funeral Home, and I realized I was missing the undertaker. Now, don't tell Greg Dunbar that I called him an undertaker. It's a funeral home director, right? But the people at Dunbar are great people. I'm never excited when we need to have a funeral, but I enjoy working with them, and I I miss them, and it was good to hear from them. We miss everybody. We're all missing each other. Ten days or so ago, I, I sent a text to my daughter who lives in Atlanta, And I said, you know, they they say that your governor is opening everything up, but you need to be really cautious about getting back into crowds and crowded places. And she texted me back and she said, don't worry, Dad, the only place I'm going is the nail salon. (laughs) She had a big smiley face. She's missing the people at her nail salon, or at least she's missing her nails anyway. And I can... I can begin to understand that because, you know, I've been thinking if this goes on much longer, I'm going to be missing my barber. And, and that's not really a good thought. You know, when I, when I go for over a month without a haircut, my hair begins to get a mind of its own. And so if this goes on much longer, when I get up to preach, Jeff is going to take one of those generic silhouettes Like you see, if you go on Zoom and you turn your camera off, right? And he's going to cover me up with one of those generic silhouettes. If you see that, you'll you'll know what happened. We're all missing each other. We're all missing each other. You know, two of the words that we have learned lately are essential and non-essential. And those words are useful if the government is telling you who should stay home and who should go to work and what business should open and what businesses should, should stay closed. But I think what we've learned over the last month and a half or so is that it, when it comes to people, everybody is essential. Nobody is a non-essential person. We all need each other. Everybody has a role. Everybody has a part to play. Everybody has something that he or she brings to our life in community. And when somebody is missing, our community is simply not whole. We all need each other. We're all essential people. Now, my friends, if that's the only lesson we've learned over the last six weeks or so, and if we don't forget that lesson, it's, it's truly life-changing, even world-changing. Because if you think about it, all throughout human history, there have been whole segments of the human race that have been deemed non-essential, disposable, slaves, women, people with dark skin, LGBT people, et cetera, et cetera. Every society in human history has had some group of people that they were willing to more or less push aside and, and, and put in the trash can. In the Middle East, it's the Bedouins. In Eastern Europe, it's the Gypsies. In Australia, it's the Aborigines. In the United States, it's the Native Americans. In China, it's the Uyghurs. In India, it's the untouchables. In biblical times, it was the Samaritans and the Gentiles. And on and on and on the list goes. Disposable people, non-essential people. If you and I have learned anything in the last six weeks, we've learned that nobody is non-essential We all need each other because we have been created for life in community together. Think about the words of the Apostles' Creed, which we'll say together in a few minutes. One of the lines of the Apostles' Creed says, we believe in the communion of saints. That's a lovely line, isn't it? 
Sometimes I think about that line. Sometimes I, I meditate on the saints that God has given me in my life. And for the ones who have gone on to glory, sometimes I just imagine them in God's presence. We believe in the communion of saints. But what if we were to expand the definition of those words as, as far as possible? And what if we were to hear those words as saying to us, we believe in the communion of all people. We believe that all people are essential. We believe that every person has been made to live life in community with every other person. At the very end of the Bible, we get a beautiful vision of the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem comes down from heaven to the earth. It's grand and glorious and big and beautiful it has 12 gates, which of course symbolically would represent the, the people of God, the 12 tribes of Israel. And the wonderful thing about the New Jerusalem is the gates are always open. Anybody can come into the New Jerusalem whenever he or she wants to come. And we read that the wealth of the nations will be brought into the New Jerusalem. And that's a wonderful line, especially if you remember the promise to Abraham and Sarah, right? Through you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And so we come full circle. All the nations of the earth bring their, their wealth and their honor and their glory into the new Jerusalem. In other words, in other words, in the new Jerusalem, there's not just one special group of essential people. There's not just one little group of chosen people people. But in the New Jerusalem, everyone's chosen. Everyone's essential. Everyone is invited to God's great wedding banquet. So my friends, what if the New Jerusalem is not simply God's vision for something that's going to happen way off at the end of time? But what if the New Jerusalem is God's vision for the way things should be even now. And what if you and I may have caught just the teeniest, tiniest glimpse of the new Jerusalem during this time of pandemic, as we remember that everyone is essential, that we all belong together, that we've all been made for life in community. Would you pray with me, please? Holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bow before you and worship you as the one who lives in perfect, loving community. Thank you for creating us in your image to live together in loving community. Thank you for reminding us in these days that we're all essential. We all need each other to be whole. We pray for that day when indeed all of us can be restored to the work that you have called us to do and the place that you have given us in the world. Oh Lord, we pray that we would never ever forget that you have made us for life in community with each other. Fill us, fill your whole world, we pray, with your love, your communion, your goodness and your grace. We pray in your precious and holy name. Amen.